Hey, what's going on everybody? Infinite Logins here with another video. All right, so this time we're gonna talk about some network attacks. I love network attacks. <laughs> if, if you've seen some of my previous content, whether it be my blog or here on YouTube, you'll see that I really love this tool called Responder. I mean, it is just like the easiest way to get, you know, hashes all over the place. It's a quick win. And there's a brand new module that just came out a few weeks ago um, called, I guess technically it's been out a few months, but it just got released to the public a few weeks ago. Um, so come check out this Twitter post. If you're not following the actual Python Responder Twitter page, you should be. <laughs> um, while you're at it, go ahead and give me a follow. But anyway, so this is where you go to get the latest and greatest news on everything Responder. And there was a blog post that got written that is a fantastic read. And we're going to go through and basically just kind of step by step go through what this blog post is talking about. And we're going to use Responder to capture hashes over DHCP, which mind blowing is super cool. Like you've seen me talk about LLM and R poisoning before, but hopefully in most modern networks, we should no longer be seeing that and it should be disabled, right? So what do you do next? Well, let's poison DHCP and still capture hashes that way. How are you gonna defend against that? All right, let's dive in. Okay, so again, like I said, go read this blog post. It's going to explain things probably in a much more elegant way than I will, uh, but I'll do my best to try to make sense of what's going on. So let's take a second and just set the stage, all right? What are we doing? Well, first, we're going to poison DHCP. Um, and what is that? What is DHCP? Well, I mean, we could literally just go out and Google, hey, what is DHCP? But it's the protocol that is used to go out and assign address information. Typically, it's known for assigning IP addresses, but it can actually do a lot more than that. It can not only assign IPs, but it might assign a DNS server. It could assign an NTP server for time settings, and it's also got the ability to assign what's called WPAD, um, and that leads us to the next rabbit hole here, but just so that way you guys can see it, this is a Windows Server box, and if I just open up the DHCP module, it's not configured currently, but we could just come in and set these various options. These are just some of the many things that you can assign as part of your DHCP lease. Like you could tell it, okay, use this time server, use this log server, whatever. So when a device connects to the network and it asks the DHCP server for an IP address, these are all the things that server can respond with as a configuration for that client. Okay, so one of the things, like I mentioned, that it can use or assign is WPAD. So what is WPAD? Now, I've never used WPAD before, not at least in the traditional, like an end user would or a sysadmin would, but I have used it for abusing things. <laughs> uh, essentially, it's, it's like a web proxy. So think like if you've ever done a hack the box machine, you might've seen like the squid proxy before. It's kind of like that, right, where you would have a server that's running this web proxy and you would configure your browser to route traffic through that proxy. And then that gives the, the manager of that proxy to be able to see things like, you know, sites that you're potentially browsing to, or maybe they can modify requests. Like a lot of firewalls might, might use WPAD to try to do content filtering on the network level or something like that. So WPAD is something that I don't know how often it's used, but we're gonna abuse that today because we are going to have DHCP basically assign a malicious WPAD configuration. And when it does that, our device, or I guess our clients that are connecting to the network, the victims, they're going to actually be using our WPAD server, our malicious WPAD server, when they go to make a web request out. And when they do that, that's when we can say, well, hey, how do we know you have permission to make this web request? Go ahead and send me your NTLMv2 hash and I'll let you know <laughs> if you have permission to go to that site. It's, All right, so let me see if I can actually do a better job at explaining this. So what we have in a normal scenario is you would have your client here on the left, you would have your DHCP server here on the right, and when the client connects to the network, maybe it reboots its machine, it enables its network interface, or just its IP lease expires. 
it's going to issue this broadcast here to everybody on the local broadcast domain, and it's going to try to find the DHCP server. The server is going to respond back, and then there's actually a couple more packets that go back and forth, you know, where you do a request and acknowledgement, but uh, just ignoring those two for simplicity's sake, what happens is a DHCP server responds back and essentially says, here's all your network information that you need. So you would normally see things like an IP address, you would have like your default gateway, you would have things like your DNS server, but then this is where you can have other things like your NTP server or even your WPAD config, right? And so like these are all the things that the DHCP server might respond back with and give to the client. So what are we doing in our attack? Well, enter the attacker, <laughs> all right? And so if this DHCP server was over here and our attacker was closer to it, we may even be able to just go ahead and respond back before the DHCP server has a chance. And that's what we're looking to abuse here with this attack. We're actually going to respond to this DHCP broadcast before the server has a chance to. And we're gonna respond with a lot of the same stuff, except we're gonna give it, instead of like valid you know, network settings here, we're just gonna say, eh, we'll give you invalid network settings. So that way it doesn't actually work for you. And we don't care about the NTP server, but we will give you a valid WPAD config that tells WPAD to look at our responder box. This is our attacker system, right? So this is where we say, okay, look back at us for your WPAD config. And then we also come in here and we just give it a very, very short lease. We give it a lease period of just 10 seconds. So that way what happens is as soon as this client connects to the network, it issues this broadcast, the attacker is the one who responds and we say, okay, here's your invalid network settings. Here's your WPAD config. Oh, and by the way, this only lasts 10 seconds. So you need to issue a second request here uh, in order for you to actually get onto the network and do stuff. And so what happens with WPAD is even if the lease expires after 10 seconds, the WPAD config stays valid until the system reboots. So the lease will expire, but the WPAD configuration is still there, which is perfect because what ends up happening is over time, this goes away right? 10 seconds go by. Now we get a new DHCP broadcast being issued and the attacker is going to say, eh, I'm going to sit this one out. <laughs> and that's when the legitimate DHCP server comes in and it assigns, you know, legit network settings, or I guess I should say valid network settings. And these valid network settings allow the client to connect to the network and communicate and do its business without any issue, right? And once it's doing that, keep in mind, it still has that poison WPAD entry. So there's certain sites that the client's going to automatically go to, like a bunch of Microsoft sites that just happen to run because Windows is Windows. And it's, when it makes those requests, that's going to actually issue a response out to this attacker box through that WPAD config. And when that response or that request gets issued, that's when the attacker is going to issue a challenge and capture the net NTLM v2 hash from the victim. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Let's dive in and actually perform the attack. Okay, so to get going, we gotta go and download the right version. So I am gonna come out and we're gonna get version 3070. And I guess I'll just download here this zip file. Um, really, I will copy this link and we can just do a quick wget here on it. Okay, so now we got that, we'll unzip it, great. And when we look in here, we now have a new folder. We'll change into that folder. And now we've got all of the responder files like you're used to seeing if you've ever used this tool before. So there's a few other things we need to do to actually kind of get this all set up. Um, if we look here, we can see that there's this configuration detail where the new module is not enabled by default. So we actually need to go into the responder.config file and update the WPAD script setting. So we want it to basically read all of this here. So I'm gonna actually open up like a text editor, throw that in there. Hopefully you guys can read that. Here we go, I'll zoom in a little bit. And there's a couple things we need to change. Like this proxy serve, that's basically a placeholder. 
that we need to go in there and replace with our own IP address. So let's go look at our network. We'll just do a quick IPA. And we've got Ethernet 0 here using 10.02.116. So I'm going to copy that because that is the web, uh, or I guess the IP address that I'm going to use. And I'm going to replace this value in both those spots here with our IP address. Um, and what this is going to do is this is going to tell any victim or any client who connects to our malicious DHCP server to go ahead and use this IP address on this port for the WPAD proxy. And when they do that and responders running, we should be able to see those requests come in over that port and then respond to them and do our NTLM challenge and, and all that fun, fun stuff. So grab all this stuff and let's go into that file. So I'm just going to say quick g edit here on responder.config. We got this little guy. Can't zoom in on this one, but we'll just go down to the spot that we need. Here we go, custom WPAD script. And I'm going to replace all this stuff here with the new one that we just modified. So we'll save that. A couple other things I want to do while I'm in here. And again, I'm sorry if this is hard to read. Um, but a couple other things I want to do is I want to actually tell it to only respond to my victim device. So I've got a machine here that's going to be our victim. That's what this Windows 10 box is. So let me just sign in to it real quick. My super secret password. Okay, so we're signed in. Let's go ahead and just see what my IP is. 10.0.2.20. So I'm going to copy this. And I'm going to tell Responder to only respond to that IP address. That way, if I've got other devices on my network, that's not going to kind of flood us. This is really a cool, useful thing to do when you're configuring scope. You never want to step outside the scope. All right. Other servers to start, it looks like we've got all these set to on at the moment. I think that might be all we need to do in the responder config file, so we'll close that out for now. And then we'll go back to our blog post. All right, we know what's going on. We got our config configured. <laughs> now it's time to run the attack. So they give you all the options you need right here. We're just going to go ahead and copy that out. We'll come back, and this is the full command that we need to run. And if we've got everything configured correctly, this should go ahead and just launch. Oh, gonna give them my password. And here we are. We are now waiting for an incoming request. Now check this out. It actually finds the legitimate DHCP server on the network, which is important because it needs to be able to allow that DHCP server to assign the correct network settings after the attack is finished. So it finds a valid DHCP server on the network, and now it's waiting for our client here, 100220, to issue a DHCP broadcast. So what I'm going to do is come over to our victim. Here we are. And I'm just going to clean up my mess, close all the stuff out. Now, rebooting this box might work to get a new lease to come out or something like that. Obviously, we could just wait it out for the lease to expire. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to disable the network adapter. And then when I re-enable this, it should issue a DHCP broadcast. And we should see a lot of... Uh, a lot of activity. Let's see what happens. Oh yeah. All right, check it out. So right away, oh man, look at that. Just flooding in. We're already getting we're already getting some NTLM goodness here. Sorry, NTLM V2 goodness. It is very different than your NTLM hash that you would get from like dumping the SAM database. Um, but Look at it. Look at that, man. We don't need to worry about LLM and R. We don't care about any legacy protocols. Let's just abuse WPAD. Why not? All right. So what happened? Let's see if we can kind of step through this and make sense of it. Uh, I mean, hopefully it all makes sense already, right? But we see here that we've got an acknowledged a DHCP request here for this 10.0.2.20 IP address. And as soon as we acknowledge that, that's when the WPAD config took place. And then this the box was able to get its own ip like i mean let's just go back and notice let's see if i open up like a command prompt and i try to ping the internet check it out i mean we're able to communicate outbound to a random website everything is just still working as you would expect we'll go to like google.com hopefully i'm not lying to you here try this again 
Oh man, live demos. This shouldn't impact the actual network connectivity of the device. We should be able to go out to the internet and pull down a web page. Let's try a browser that's not Edge. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think it's just Edge being Edge. <laughs> but look at this. I mean, this is going and it's it's capturing all of these different requests in the back end and each time it does, it captures that that Intel MV2 hash. So, you, I mean, you can see how this is super impactful. This box, I mean, you don't even know that that the attack is going on. All you do is just use your machine like normal and it doesn't impact the network or anything. Now, how do we stop this? Well, you can stop responder and then once you stop responder, you would go back to your box and this system would just need a reboot because remember wpad config stays until the system reboots and as long as responder isn't there to repoison it, that should clear this out. Let's take this a step further, yeah? So we've got these hashes. Let's just copy one here. And let's then go and try to crack it. I've actually got a blog post that I wrote about LLM and R poisoning, infinitelogins.com. Um, but we could use that same blog post to still perform our like brute force attack here with these hashes. I think that's under part two. Yeah, cracking NTL MV2 hashes. So if you haven't seen this before, feel free to check it out. Uh, but basically, only thing I care about is the command that we used with hashcat to actually crack these hashes. So I'm gonna copy this command here. Now when I ran this, I did this on a Windows box. So we've got hashcat exe. We may need to, you know, obviously modify this slightly. We just need to do hashcat tech mode of zero, tech m uh, of 5600. That is the Intel MV2 hash format. The hashes.txt file, as long, along with rocku, which is actually in user, share, words list, rocku. I think it's just user, like that. Output crack.txt. Okay, I think we're good with this. So let's go ahead and grab one of these hashes, throw that into hashes.txt. And then once we have that, should be able to grab this whole thing and see if we can't crack this password. Uh, no such file. User share word list rock you dot text. Let's do a quick LSLA on user share word lists. Ah, we've got it unzipped. Let me, or still zipped up. And I can never remember, don't laugh at me, okay? But I can never remember how to actually unzip this. So I wrote myself a blog post um, so I could just run this because I, I can never remember the format or the syntax for gzip. So we'll run that, that should unzip it for us. And then we should be good to run that here. Now this will take a second to crack the password. And obviously what we're doing is a dictionary attack. So if the password for this user account is not present within this rocku.txt word list, then it's not actually going to crack anything. It's not going to find the clear text equivalent. But I know what the password is and I know it's a dumb password. So I would bet money that the password is present in this rocku.txt list. So we'll give it a second. I'll pause the video and I'll be back as soon as it's finished. Okay, I really didn't even need to pause the video because it is already done. So it looks like it did say that it was cracked, um, but I'm not able to see it in here. That's okay. We've told it to output into crack.txt. So let's cat out crack.txt and we can see password123 is the password for this D Lillard user account. Finally, we can do something like our desktop and connect to the box here with username D Lillard and password123 and check this out. As long as 3389 remote desktop is running on that system, we have now hacked into it. So check it out, we did it. We have abused DHCP to do uh, a poison WPAD config, which then allowed us to capture a net NTL MV2 hash. We then threw that into Hashcat, we cracked that to get the clear text equivalent, which we then used to just RDP into the machine. You guys are hackers, great job. Honestly, I think this is a super cool attack. Um, I am definitely excited to be using this on my next engagement where I have an opportunity to, and I hope you guys learn something as well. 
if I got anything wrong here, if my understanding is incorrect, please let me know. I'd love to learn and talk about this correctly. Um, but yeah, if, uh, if you guys enjoy this type of content, hit the like button, subscribe. I've got tons of other videos that are kind of like this. Obviously, more is to come, and I appreciate you being here. Have a great day, and I'll see you in the next one.